flight is from Canada Missing Project. And I'm talking to you today from one of my favorite spots in the world. And I live near Red Rocks Amphitheater. And this is a an area that not a lot of people go to. It's private and uh, beautiful. The, uh, the rocks in this area are mind-boggling. But uh, anyhow, that's where I'm at today, just outside of Morrison, Colorado. Won't be here long, but uh, I want to give you one last look at what I live around. A few things. This is a copyrighted broadcast by David Politis, the Canyon Missing Project. Anyone using it is using it without my consent. So if you can make some comments on those sites, I'd greatly appreciate it that they're stealing my content. I've got some nasty comments about why I always say that at the beginning of my videos. Well, I don't know anyone out there that's had more theft occur from their content than me. So there is the need that I have to do it. Now, some of you are going to make some bad comments about the wind. Out of my control, but I obviously have tried my best to pick a nice day for you. A uh, few things. Someone else asked me the other day, Dave, how come you don't comment on recent missing person cases? Good question. And the reason I don't is most of the time, the reporters doing the work do a horrendous job. And there aren't enough facts out there to really determine what happens. And it takes sometimes months to get reports and things to figure out what really did transpire. <laughs> So I, I'll sometimes put a Twitter out if somebody disappears, of course. Doesn't mean I'm saying it's a missing 411 case. It's just stating that you've got to be aware of it. So from the mailbag, some great, great letters. Thank you. And one of the most head turners I've ever had. And uh, I'll share it with you this week. So first one, Mr. Politis, I'm very much enjoy your work for the citizens throughout the world that are missing. What you're exposing is very important and needed. We need to know what is going on in our parks and elsewhere. I've read them. I have read most everything I could find on the UFO phenomena in my library. As a former Marine, nuclear security employee, hunter, and 63-year-old retiree, I try to read and decipher all material on a variety of subjects. I try to separate wheat from chaff. Dave, your material is wheat by far. I have theories, and I may share them someday with you, but for now I recommend, if you have not, to read the Hup Bud Hopkins Missing Time Books as it relates to UFO question. Aggressive hypnosis by Bud Hopkins has been out of this world good. Now, just something about that. Bud Hopkins was phenomenal. He has since passed on, but Bud's work with UFO and abductees has been out of this world. And people have asked, well, Dave, why don't you do a reverse hypnosis with some of the people that have disappeared? Again, good question. Years ago, when we first started to walk in this territory, we wanted to understand where the landmines were at. One of them, the other people in the missing persons group says, hey, if you're going to interview missing people or ask them to do things for you, don't write about them. Otherwise, they may feel victimized again. So again, if I go through all the effort of doing reverse hypnosis and something phenomenal comes out of it and I can't talk about it, what good is that? So that's one reason I don't do it. Second of all, I don't proactively go out and meet missing people for that exact reason. I don't want them to say something that I want to use and them to feel re-victimized. I, I wouldn't want to do that to anybody. I respect people too much. So a mailbag story. This person obviously has read all the nine books and has deeply thought about what it all means. Good day Mr. Politis and team. The purpose of my letter is to bring attention to a few things that are not obvious to anybody so far in the onion that is the mystery of so many layers. And though they may seem like mere coincidences, I, as a soul and spirit of truth-seeking, don't believe or indulge in such things as coincidence. My motivation in writing is nothing else but perhaps to steer your mind in a way to thinking about the strange circumstances of shared characteristics or profile points that you so brilliantly have delineated in your 411 documentaries. Also the families, the victims in our race is another conviction that motivates me, as I'm sure it did you to reach out beyond the grasp of what we can understand to search for answers and in that search protect what we hold sacred to our hearts. 
I arrived at these series through my discipline of writing, poetry, research, and Jungian psychology, depth psychology, military history, mythology, theology, cross-cultural analysis, and many other disciplines that are with me as I'm writing my first thoughts. Well enough of that, let me get to the brass tacks. I shall use some of the profile points as I construct. Boulders, boulder formations, and the prevalence of rocks around the areas of the clusters. I want to touch on this topic and subject for the symbolic reasons of the rock and its special relationship to man, both as a spiritual being and a warrior. This is something that is highly symbolic in the missing hunter cases, and as I shall further indicate to all cases, including the children. To be a hunter, one must be in isolation, possess perseverance, be single-minded, have narrowness of vision, highly symbolic to the archery and crossbow weaponry carried by the hunters. All traits linked to the rock. They say of a man who is a strong hunter, he is a rock, or determined like a rock. The first cave paintings found in, around Spain and France depict hunting scenes on rock. Rock holds a sacred meaning to man. After all, Excalibur was drawn from a rock, was it not? Which leads me to specify on the two characteristics shared by the missing people and the rock symbolism. Firstly, the ones who were hunters and had these rock-like characteristics in their personalities, highly trained and skilled, and were in isolation or alone at the time of the disappearance, like a rock. There are two of the most ancient things that bind man to earth. His existential plight, are we alone? And his fight for survival, if we were to find himself face to face with the answer to the are we alone question in the form of, no you are not, there is a god, a devil, and enemies coming for you. Wow. First time I read that, I thought, holy cow. Uh, I'm glad to see someone of high intellect spent some time thinking through this and thinking back through history. Now in my books I've talked about fairies, I've talked about things living in rock spirits like in Iceland. I've done all of these things in an attempt to pull in mythology, myths, legends, etc. to try to understand what's happening. Because in every myth and legend there's an ounce of truth. And if you don't think so, go back and study because it's, it's true. <laughs> Now this man obviously has taken that step a point further, which I greatly appreciate because it causes me and my team to think at a higher level as well. So I'll read more from him later on in the next video, but right now I'm going to take you down a path. Uh, one, a, a path that's going to lead to why humans disappear, specifically with dogs. Maybe not the answer why, but I'll show you the assimilation. One last letter from the mailbag. My name is Blank. I'm a high school teacher in the Navajo Nation. Unfortunately, I don't have my skinwalker stories or other weirdness to share with you pertaining to where I work. Maybe someday. But I did want to share with you an observation related to my training. I happen to have a PhD in linguistics from Arizona State. Your intuition regarding the prevalence of missing people with German heritage is on point. But I'd like to extend this even further. If you count not only people with straight German surnames, but also include people with Germanic surnames, the list grows incredibly. Stop here. Again, this man has spent a great deal of time going through the literature and pulling out things that fit our profile. I'll go on. If you don't know, the phrase Germanic refers to, in the world of language study, to a group of languages that inhabit most of Northern Europe, including English, German, Dutch, Danish, Norwegian, Swedish, and a handful of more esoteric ones. Now, language is not necessarily a proxy for bloodline, but the correlation is pretty high. In other words, most people with Germanic surnames are probably going to have some heritage that extends back to the Germanic peoples of Northern Europe, although not guaranteed as people inherit surnames through marriage, slavery, etc. But the upshot seems to be this. People with some white Northern European Germanic heritage are probably more likely to disappear than other groups. I recall in an interview, interview you did where you mentioned that very few black people go missing in the manner you've described. You said that's very strange. As I continue to read your books, I'll do some, some work to divide the names up according to their origin. Aside from the obvious Germanic surnames, there are many hidden ones. For example, may think, we may think Gonzalez with an S is Spanish or Mexican. 
but it in fact comes from Visigoth Visigothic, example Germanic, presence in Spain over a millennia ago. Hence, David Gonzalez with an S, page 171 of the first book, is almost certainly of mixed Germanic heritage. So while we might not immediately lump him in with the more obvious Travis, Travis Zweig, it would, it would be prudent to do so. A much more complete picture begins to emerge. Sincerely. Bingo. Folks, this is the kind of stuff that really turns my head and makes me aware that there's much more to this picture than we understand. Yeah, I have, I've identified a series of people with German names and people from Germany that have disappeared that were physicists, but it's much greater than that, as exampled with this. And I kind of get flustered by some of the people who make some of the comments who obviously don't know a thing about the research. Um, so, I don't want to get on that rant again. But, thank you so much for that. It was outstanding. Now what I want to do is I want to read you some stories straight out of my books that deal with people who have disappeared in the wilderness with dogs. Some of you believe this doesn't happen. And I'm telling you, the whole Eastern book, probably half of it deals with people who disappeared with dogs. But we'll start with this one. His name is Lawrence Prang. It's from the West book. Missing August 14th, 1958, Sealy Lake, Montana, age of disappearance 20. As it comes straight from the book, one of the oldest rules when visiting the great outdoors is to never be alone. This is the rule that Lawrence Prang broke when he visited the area of Sealy Lake on August 10th, 1958. Lawrence was from Lake Villa, Illinois, and always enjoyed the outdoors. His interest in wildlife led him to study to be a wildlife technician at the University of Montana, Missoula. Lawrence found an old wooden cabin behind the university and he made it his home. Lawrence's girlfriend, Susan Heck, was a fellow student. Lawrence enjoyed all parts of the wild and that included hunting. The trip to Sealy Lake region was intended to be a hunt for mountain goats. Lawrence had made a trip to this region before and he would again take on this trip his companion, a German shepherd named Queen. Lawrence entered the wilderness carrying a backpack with two rifles, two rifles, and Queen carried her own backpack with supplies. Good dog. Lawrence was due out of the mission range on August 14th, and he had agreed to contact his parents and girlfriend when he was out. He never made the calls. The alarm was sounded, and Mr. and Mrs. Prang headed for Montana. Sue Heck headed for the search center. Searchers utilized helicopters made on horseback, specially trained trackers, and even brought in canines in the hope of luring him out, or at, lure, at least luring out Prang's dog. After more than a month, of, a month of searching, the SAR teams found nothing. On September 20th, a SAR team riding the range saw Queen running wildly through the brush. She was seen on the northwest side of Lindbergh Lake. The area around Lindbergh is very lush with thick vegetation. There's ample water in the area for all wildlife. SAR teams could not get near Queen because she was too jumpy and nervous. The location where the team spotted Queen was more than three miles from the primary search location at Rocky Heights. The SAR team returned to the base and asked Lawrence's girlfriend to accompany them in an attempt to retrieve Queen. Sue Heck was the only person who could get close enough to the dog. The dog eventually calmed down and followed the teams back to base camp. After a day of calming the dog and feeding her, searchers took Queen to the top of the primary peaks they believed Lawrence had hunted. Queen wanted nothing to do with even being on the mountain and wanted to get out of the area. Searchers carefully examined the dog and did not find any wounds indicating that Schmidt had been in a fight with an animal. Lawrence's parents and his girlfriend were puzzled by the fact that Queen's backpack had been removed as it was something that needed human intervention to take off. Searchers never found this or any of Lawrence's equipment. Teams theorized that whatever happened to Lawrence must have occurred while he was, while he had his equipment on his back because they never found his campsite. That's strange. Case summary. There is something about the general CV Lake region that doesn't bode well for hikers and hunters traveling alone. I've tracked dozens of cases in which hikers and hunters have died and the canine companion is sitting next to the corpse refusing to leave. This is the only case I've ever seen where the canine was running loose in the wild and the hunters never found. Now I remind you, this is the first book I ever wrote. Since then, there, excuse me, there have been others. It would also seem as if Queen was deathly afraid of the circumstances surrounding Lawrence's disappearance and wanted nothing to do with whatever may have happened. 
Even if Lawrence was murdered, you'd expect the dog to go back to the corpse. Lawrence may have been well armed, but as searchers, his girlfriend and parents stated, both of his rifles were kept in his backpack. If the rifles were not readily available, Lawrence could have been jumped by something and never had a chance to defend himself, which is one exact reason why I carry a pistol, either on my chest or on my hip, because it's very hard to get to a rifle on your backpack if you're going through grizzly territory. Three miles east of where Queen was located is the Timberline region where you'd expect a goat or sheep hunter to set up camp. The area is dotted with small, small lakes, which makes this a difficult region to search. Almost in the middle of this beauty is Lucifer Lake. What a name like that. I wouldn't like to camp there. That name should have been in the Missing 411, The Devil's in the Detail. On September 24th, the search for Lawrence was over. His parents went to his cabin in Pate Canyon and collected his belongings. Sue Heck returned to the university and resumed her studies to become a wildlife tech. The Prangs went back to Illinois without ever knowing what happened to their son. Queen went, Queen went back to Illinois with the Prangs. Oh, if only this dog could talk. Now, the important part to that story, in my mind, is they never found his body, which is very odd. Uh, as many searchers, as many days they covered that region, they should have found a campsite, they should have found his belongings. You know, it's been 70 years since the incident, and they should have found his belongings by now, as they'll never really go away. Steel frame backpack of that era, it'll never go away. So what happened? Another interesting part is they said, well, Queen's pack that she was carrying needed human intervention to take off. How did that come off? I've written about several hunters that were going for sheep and goat at high, high elevation above Timberline that disappeared. This is another one. But the thought that a, a canine saves you from some disaster, not true. is in Missing 411 North America and beyond. The man's name was Todd Hoffman. He disappeared September 27, 2010, 39 years old. He was hiking in the Dev Seven Devils area south of Riggins, Idaho. After having researched thousands of missing person cases, the location where Todd Hoff Hofflander vanished is a classic location for people to go missing. High in elevation, dozens of small lakes, little vegetarian, vegetation and lots of exposed rock and boulders to be the ideal topography for people to vanish permanently. On September 27, Todd was out for a four-day hike with his black Labrador Ruby and a friend named Jeff Weber. Todd had complained about having a sore knee and decided to split up with his hunting partner. Two issues there, point of separation and disability or injury. He advised Jeff that he was going to travel downhill and they'd meet at the river. They never met up. A witness did report seeing Todd at McAfee Cow Camp, which is approximately one half of the distance down the mountain to the river. When Todd didn't arrive at the location, Jeff called for assistance. The U.S. Forest Service and local county sheriff's department went into the woods and searched for Todd. The effort to find Mr. Hofflander lasted 15 days. The search efforts were suspended until October 15th when Ruby was found by other hikers on the eastern slopes of the Seven Devils Mountain, the opposite side of the mountain from where Todd was last seen. So, Todd's hiking downhill to the river. She's found on the other side of the mountain. Searchers went back into that area and for several days searched and found nothing. Todd vanished in the Hell's Canyon wilderness, probably on the eastern slope area of the Seven Devils Mountain. Notable geographical names for this area are He Devil Lake, Pur Purgatory Lake, Devil's Throne, Seven Devils Lake, getting the point. I have stated in Missing 411 books that there appears to be a correlation between the names and geographic locations and where people vanish. Locations have names for specific reasons. Why were these names such? That's almost an, an impossible thing to figure out. I've tried before going into areas where people have lived and families have lived for decades. Find out. Todd Hoff, Hofflander left behind two small children and his wife Julie. On October 5th, 2010, an article had the following statement from his wife about Todd's relationship with Ruby. She and Todd are inseparable. So if he did go up, that would explain why we haven't seen any sign of the dog down where we were searching. The dog was eventually found, but that was only a thing found. In the same article, Julie makes a statement about the search success. They found 
found, quote, they found no traces of anything, nothing. It's baffling. One small point that I think is underreported in Todd's case is his knee injury. In many cases where people vanish, they have some type of disability. Todd's disability was his knee, and that caused him to branch off from his partner and vanish. The reality is that they found, haven't found Todd's equipment, and that's concerning. So let's think about this. Point of separation, the name association for the area, Devil. He was walking and he was halfway at least towards water, and he had an injury. And there's more. Uh, search and Rescue didn't find anything of him, and it's been years since, and they've never found anything of Todd. Now, I've read you just two stories, and we could go on, and I could read like this for maybe days from my books about people disappearing with animals. Now, in these two cases, people weren't found, animals were found. There's equal number of cases where dogs were never found. There's no correlation to the type of dog and the disappearance. Most of the time, it's usually a bigger dog that disappears when the kids disappear. The idea about bringing in a spouse or a relative to help in the search or help corral the dog, great idea. There's also a superb idea to take the dog back out and help him look for Todd. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, look in the area for the missing person. It, it, that makes all the sense in the world. Now, the last thing is, in all these cases, you got to remember, Search and Rescue also has cadaver-sniffing dogs. A, a dog can smell a cadaver miles away, and that's their job. So, when they're out there, and they have a general idea where somebody's missing, and even though it may be miles away where he actually died, the dog can pick up that scent. But in the cases I write about, this isn't happening perplexing. Um, some of you have written to me about, oh, you know, some of these people fell into an underground cave system. If that happened, the canine would track right to the point where the person went in the ground. And then, then they'd send in spelunkers to go look. But this never happens. So people going underground, I've never even put that as a five cent thought in my mind. So, and I, I, in the minds of the people I work with, I don't know that that's ever happened. So, enjoy the Red Rocks. I should be back with you probably in a couple weeks, max, maybe a week. So, thanks for watching.